God has made us for relationship, and he has made us for connection. And, and so we, we rightly, when the thought of that disappears, I mean, could you imagine being entirely alone? There is a, there's a chamber the quietest chamber in the world. I think I was reading about it. It's in Australia. And it's like negative decibels, like crazy. Like you, you walk in and it, people, it's so quiet. They said that the record of somebody being in there is an hour. It just, it kills and absorbs all sound. And, and so you, you would just have this ultimate feeling of loneliness. And, and so one hour is the longest that somebody's made it in there before they said, that's enough. Now imagine what it would be like to walk with Jesus for three years, to know Jesus, to experience the love of Jesus, to experience all that Jesus has done, to, to be there for the miracles, to be there for the healings, to, to be there to see when demons were casted out, to watch the compassion of Jesus as he, he looked on people and his heart broke and he began to teach them, to, to see the feedings. The miraculous feedings of people. To see all of this and to walk day by day with Jesus and to see this. And then to hear Jesus say, I'm going away. Can you see how you would fear, feel lonesome? Can you see how you would be distraught? That's the background for our text today. That's the background where, where what I want you to, to see in this text and, and what I want you to remember from this text is this. Jesus will never ghost you, but he will Holy Ghost you. Jesus will never ghost you, but he will Holy Ghost you. Our lesson today is based on this principle, that Jesus in his absence, in his physical absence, has left us with a spiritual presence. Jesus, though physically not with us, has given to us the Holy Spirit to live in us and to guide us just as though Jesus was standing right next to us. That's the purpose of the Holy Ghost. We talked a lot about the Holy Spirit, and a lot of things can get wonky real fast, right? But the absolute thing that I want you to remember today and to remember from now on is that when you think about the Holy Spirit, when you think about the job and the role and the purpose of the Holy Spirit, it's this, Jesus saying, I'm not going to ghost you, but I'm going to Holy Ghost you. In Jesus' physical absence, he gives to us the presence of the Holy Spirit. L look at verse 15. It'll kind of uh, preempt us as we get into our text here today. Verse 15 of John chapter 4 says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That helper there is uh, the Greek word paraclete. You might know that. It's, it's a counselor. It's one who comes beside. The, the word was used in that world and, and that time as like a lawyer. Where you would go before, if you were to go before a court, you couldn't speak on your own behalf. People were making accusations against you, and you couldn't speak on your own behalf. But you had this one who was your helper, who was your counselor, who, who was the one there to fight for you and be with you and represent you and help you in every way that he could. And so Jesus says, I'm sending you that to be with you forever. You read through the, whole, you read through the, the, the Bible, you read through the Old Testament, and the Holy Ghost is there. The, the, the Spirit of God is there, right? Amen? Okay? But it's different, isn't it? The Spirit of God, as we read through the Old Testament, comes upon an individual for, for a single purpose or for a single season. It, it may come upon a small group. But the idea that, that everyone who is a follower of God receives the Holy Spirit, that doesn't happen in the Old Testament. Have you noticed that? And so what Jesus says to them here is, all of you, all of my followers, all who receive me, will receive this helper, and he will not leave you. That's amazing. Why is it in the New Testament, why is it in the New Covenant that we can abide in Christ, that we can be guaranteed that we will receive salvation and we will abide in Christ? It's because Christ is right next to us, because he's given us the Holy Spirit. Christ's physical presence is in heaven. We await for his return. But the Spirit of God indwells us and keeps us. And if, if you've been saved and you know the Spirit, you know that urge. You know that feeling when, when you start to feel tempted and you, 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 you're overwhelmed with this is wrong and, and, and I should do something else. And, and this isn't the way a Christian should live. 
You, you know that feeling when you see somebody who's probably a random stranger sometimes, and you just get this urge, I need to go talk with them. I need to see if I can help them. As you read the scripture, it teaches you. As you, as you experience things in life, when, when false teaching, you get, you get approached to it, you, you just have this like, that ain't right. Something's off there. You get this discernment because Jesus has given you a helper to help you abide, to help you walk with Christ, to help you live for Christ in his absence. And so it is that Jesus will tell us in this text that he will never ghost you, but he will Holy Ghost you. All right, four things I want us to see as we, as we get into this text here in John 14. The first is this, Jesus comforts us with his presence. Jesus comforts us with his presence, which, which sounds kind of funny because he's going away. But here's what he says, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. The first promise that Jesus makes to us in this passage is this. He will not leave us as orphans. Though he is not physically here, he has not abandoned us. Though we can't physically see him and talk with him and walk with him in the way that the disciples did, we know that he is not far. We know that he is with us. We feel the presence of the Lord because he has given us his spirit. He promises them that he would return to them. There was comfort in the distant future. We, too, today, we await for the Lord's return. We don't know when it will be, but we know that at any moment, at, right? No, not. At any moment, we are to live, and we are to hope, and we are to point forward to the future that Jesus Christ will return. He has not abandoned you. The second truth is this. Jesus will not leave us alone. He will not leave us alone. Look at verse 20. He says, In that day, you know I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. The disciples' relationship to Jesus is, is similar to Jesus' relationship it, with the Father. When we are in Christ, we are uh, in the, the love of Christ, in the relationship with Christ, in relationship with the Father. We experience the Father's love, the Son's love, the Spirit's love. We are in Him, and He is in us. Second is this. Jesus comforts us with a pledge of love. He comforts us with His pledge of love. Look at verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not, not Ericrat, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the father who sends me. Here's the pledge that Jesus makes if you look at this text. Here's the pledge that Jesus makes. He says, he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, I don't know if you're a, a Bible marker, but that's a good one to underline. That is a, a promise from the, the very lips of Jesus Christ. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. If we love him, God will love us. Christ will love us. This pledge, though, it, it, it can be confirmed. It, it can be seen. 
Because there's a condition that Jesus tells us that shows us whether or not we are in this relationship with him. That we are under this, this banner and this pledge. What's the condition? If we love him. If we love him. Whoever has my commandments and keeps him, it is he who loves me. This isn't works righteousness. What this is, is this is the evidence of of fruit. This is the hope that we can have, that we see a changed life, that we see that the Holy Spirit has come into us, that we've been changed, that we have a desire to live for God, that, 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 that we have a, a, an expression that's shown that, that we discipline our life and we, we love God because he has changed us, he has worked in us, we have seen the Father's love. We, we might talk about this in, in different ways. We might say that, that if you follow Jesus as your Lord, if he's in charge of your life and you're seeking to follow him and you're, you're changing things in your life to follow him, showing Jesus as king of your life, living a life that's surrendered to Jesus, or simply just being a Christ follower. Friends, the Bible gives us no help for a life that, that at some point makes a commitment to Christ and there is no evidence for any kind of change in that life. That is an empty faith. We looked at this as we went through James, didn't we? That, that, that real faith produces real change. And why? Because the promise of the Holy Spirit. Because if we're in Christ and we receive the Spirit, the Spirit will be at work in our lives. Now you might have uh, times and seasons where you're disobedient to the Lord. But if you have the Spirit, you, you're miserable in those seasons. You know what's going on. Anybody walk through one of those seasons? You know it. And you're fighting it and you're kicking it. And Christ says, I won't leave you alone. He'll, I'll pester you. And you come to your senses and you wake up. You're like, the, you're like the son that walked away from the father and you run back and the father embraces you. This is what Jesus promises to us. This is, this is the love that he has for us. This unique manifestation that Christ is going to... And notice what he says here. He says, I, I will confirm my, my love to you and the Father's love to you. It's very personal, right? And, and because the disciples were, were expecting that Jesus would immediately come back and, and restore Israel, and, and he was going to be a political Messiah primarily, they're, they're still not quite getting it. They're still a, a little bit confused uh, look here in verse 22. It says Judas, this is a different Judas than the one that had just left. It, he, he's also listed as Judas of James or the son of James. He's also known as Thaddeus. He asks, Lord, how is it that you're going to manifest yourself to us but not to the world? Do you, do you catch his confusion? How is it that it's just going to be to us? What are you going to do in your, in your absence when you leave that's going to manifest your, your love and, and manifest yourself just to us and, and, and not, not to everybody? Because again, they thought that, that Jesus would immediately return and, and immediately kick out the Romans and immediately set up a kingdom on earth. They hadn't gotten it yet. They hadn't fully understood yet what Christ was coming to do. And, and Jesus answers him and he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him. We will make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Again, here's the pledge. He who loves me will be loved by the Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. You see, this is uh, not corporate. This is personal. This is not a revelation that the whole world gets or understands. It is those to whom uh, Christ reveals himself to the Spirit and, and they respond in faith. This is, this is a personal commitment, a personal following of Jesus Christ. You, you don't get this just because you grew up in the South and there's a lot of churches. You, you don't get this just because your parents were faithful Christians. You don't get this even if you just, just uh, come to church. 
See, what Jesus is talking about here is a personal relationship with Christ. A surrendered life. Someone who has heard the gospel message. They have understood what it is that, that Jesus came to do, why he did it, that he came to earth sinless, went to the cross, died on the cross for my sins, and that I need to trust and repent in him because I'm a sinner and the wrath of God is due to me unless something happens where I can be saved. And for an individual that realizes that, repents of their sins, confesses, trusts in Christ, Christ promises the Spirit. He promises this life. This isn't general for everybody. This is for those who would be Christ followers have you done that? Can you claim this pledge? Can, can you stay honestly that I love the Lord, I, I, I know the Lord, and I love the Lord, and I'm living to follow the Lord? If so, then these promises are for you. But if not, Jesus lists consequences here. He, he lists negatively that a person who does not love or keep his word, that, that person refuses to do what Jesus says, refuses to, to, to do what Jesus ha, has done, and, and they prove that they do not love him. So the simple question is this, do you love Jesus? And if you love Jesus, does your life show that you love Jesus? We make it real complicated, don't we? But that's the heart of it. Do you love Jesus? Are you seeking to follow him? If so... What an incredible promise and pledge that he will be with us, that he will love us, that the grace and the favor of the Father will be upon us as well. So we've seen that Jesus comforts us with his presence. We're not going to be left alone. He's not going to ghost us. Jesus comforts us with his pledge. If we love him, he will love us. Third is this, Jesus comforts us with his partner. He will give us the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring them to your remembrance and all that I have said to you. So here Jesus gives a, a little bit more of, a, of an explanation of what's going to happen when, when he departs. He, he's already told them at the beginning of, of this section that, that the Comforter is going to come. He will send the Comforter. The Holy Spirit will come upon them. And now he, he begins to explain a little bit more of what that Helper is going to do, of the, the necessity and the importance of having the Helper alongside of them. That, that in his physical absence, Christ's presence will still be amongst them because they have the Spirit. One of the ways he says here that the Spirit will help is that the Spirit will bring to their minds what Jesus had said and will teach them what it means and how to live it out. You know, one of the, the great my mysteries and blessings that I have gotten to experience is that God called me to be a pastor. He, he called me to, uh, uh, to a life and a vocation that is dedicated to, to studying and teaching and presenting the Word of God. And, and, and man, I, I, I just feel so blessed that the thing that I love to do the most is the very thing that God has called me to do, and, and you all find it engaging enough that you pay for me to come here and do it for you. But I want you to know this. I am not the only one with the Holy Spirit in this church. Every believer has the Spirit. And what the Spirit does through me as I study and I pray and, and I seek to teach and how he, he speaks. Let, let me tell you, it's not even that I'm really that smart. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. My, my authority and my job is to present the Word of God, not my opinions. And it's so long as I'm presenting the Word of God, it's so long as I'm trying to, to give a plain meaning and understanding and, and show you what it says, it, it's not me that's convicting you. It's not me, really, that's teaching you. It is the Spirit of God that dwells within you that when the Word of God is proclaimed, the Spirit of God activates in your life that Word of God. So heaven help me and heaven help us as a church 
If we ever try to get away from the Word of God, if we ever try to substitute the plain teaching of God's Word for for some other kind of fancy or showy or, or something else, because that's not what the Spirit of God works with. He uses the Word of God in your life. And and he does that not just through me. As you read the word, you'll find the Spirit of God brings to your mind that which you need to know. You'll find opportunities and times where where you'll be speaking with with a friend or a loved one, a neighbor, a co-worker, and and the word of God will will come into your mind and and you will have a, a word to share with that individual because the Spirit of God is at work in you and that's how he works. Just as though Christ was beside you saying, hey, you need to tell him about that verse. That's what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives. He'll bring recall for all of those things. He will help us that that we can understand and that we can share the Word of God. He, He makes it so that we're not ignorant of the Word, but that we can we can share the Word. Some of you are scared to death of this. Some of you are like, I don't know what to say. I, I, don't know, I don't know how I'll say it. I don't know how I'll remember it. I don't know. I, I, I just, I don't know, so I don't want to do it. Well, guess what? Here's the promise. The promise is, if you take time to seek to know the Word of God, to put it in your heart, and, and you are willing to follow the Spirit wherever He leads you, when you get to that point that He has led you somewhere, He will help you that you can share and communicate, that you could tell somebody about Jesus and and how Jesus is your Savior, what he's done in your life, and how if they trust in the gospel and believe in him, they can be his Savior as well. That's why God has given us his Spirit, just as though Jesus was with us, urging us, helping us, encouraging us. So we have the Spirit of God in our lives to help us. So we've seen that, the, that Jesus comforts us with his spirit. He confirms his pledge. If we love him, he will love us. He gives us his partner in the Holy Spirit. The last thing that I want you to see in this text that Jesus gives to us is peace. He gives to us peace. Verse 27, he says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let your hearts not be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Jesus, again, this whole chapter is built around the fact that Jesus understands the anxiety, he understands the, the, the hardship, he understands the, the pain that, that his disciples are going through. We, we talked about this last week, the, the fact that he is, is comforting to them is very encouraging because there's a sense in which he could have said, hey dummies, I've told you about this for three years, why aren't you ready? But instead he encourages them and lovingly explains over and over and over and over again. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to be with you. It's going to be okay. And here he says, I will give you peace. Peace. What a beautiful word, isn't it? We want peace in our hearts. We want peace in our lives. We want peace in our world. This world does not know peace. This world ruled by Satan, infected by sin. It doesn't know peace with God. It knows anguish and pain and suffering, dominance and bloodshed. Uh, Imagine what it would be just to have peace. To have peace. Some of you, your lives don't have much peace. You have distraught relationships. You have difficult jobs. You feel like everything is at war and everything is a fight. You're you're always trying to to get the one up. You're always trying to position yourself better in 
and, and, and you find yourself just worn out, not knowing what to do, because you're not resting in the peace that Jesus provides for you. He provides for us peace. It's interesting here, he says, not as the world. Not as the world. What does the world mean for peace? You know, right now, there's the, the conflict in, 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 with Israel, and, and so we hear a lot about peace, right? Peace in the Middle East, right? Every, every politician has, has uttered that phrase since I've been alive, right? Peace in the Middle East, and, and there's still not peace. Because for the world, peace means the absence of hostility. The absence of hostility. The conditions have to be just right between multiple players so that there can be peace. That's not the kind of peace that Jesus gives. The kind of peace that Jesus gives is that your whole world can be falling apart. You can be uh, given the worst the worst news from your doctor, the worst diagnosis that you could ever imagine, and you know what? You, you're, you're bothered by it, you're worried by it, but you know what? You have peace. Why? Because you know Jesus as your Savior, and you know that no matter what happens, you are His. And so, you can live with peace. Are we living in the peace that Jesus gives to us? If we know the Lord, if we know his love, if God loves us the way that it's talked about in this passage, we love the Lord, we love God, and God pledges to love us, his spirit dwells within us. Friends, let America fall apart. Now, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're worried about the things on this earth so much. But I, I can tell you, I don't want that to happen. But I tell you what, if it does happen... I know I'll be okay. I know I'll be okay. Why? Because I have the peace of Jesus in my heart that no circumstance can overcome. I have the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life that will guide me and protect me and lead me. And I know that I have the pledge of God the Father that he loves me. The sovereign creator of all the universe, the one to whom everything owes its being and owes its existence, the one who by the providence of his hand holds and sustains and moves everything that we experience, that is the God who loves me, who has pledged his love. What can come against me? Do you see that? That's what it means to truly know Christ. To truly know his love. Jesus knows that the time is getting short. He ends here in, in verse 31 and he tells them to rise and prepare and to leave. They're actually going to they're gonna, they're gonna wait until the end of verse 17 before they leave to go to the garden. There's just more that he wants to tell them. But I want you to remember this. I hope that, that this, this, this message will, inst if it just instills this to you, Jesus will not ghost you. He will wholly ghost you. He will not abandon you. He will not leave you. Though his physical presence is not amongst us at this moment that we can see and touch and feel, he has given to us the helper. He has given to us the Holy Spirit that we might uh, know that his love for us, we might be guided by him, we might experience the comfort and the peace that he would provide for us. But remember this. To experience this, you have to have the relationship with Jesus that Jesus talks about here. You have to, to trust in the Lord as your Savior. You have to walk with him in fellowship. You have to follow the guidance of the Spirit, not, not grieving the Spirit by uh, complicating your spiritual life, by holding on to sins, letting go of those things in your life that are idols, seeking to follow Christ in all things. Let me ask you this simply. Do you love the Lord? Do you have that kind of love for Him? If not, why? 
Is it because you've never trusted in Christ? I, I would invite you today, at this moment, you can, you can turn to Christ and repent of your sin and realize that you, you need him and what he's done for you and commit to, to following him as Lord and Savior, and he will save you and the Spirit will immediately come into you and never, ever leave you. Have you done that? Oh, I pray that you wouldn't walk out of here today without doing that. Second, are you walking with him? Are you walking with the Lord? Is there something in your life that's hindering your walk with the Lord? If so, get before God and work that out. Repent of such, and he will receive you. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you that you might follow him that you might know him and you might walk with him. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I, I'm walking with the Lord. I, I'm experiencing these things. Fantastic. Are you serving him? Are you growing? He, he has something for you. He has called you unto good works, which he has prepared for you beforehand. Are you serving the Lord? Are you asking and saying, where can I serve you? Are you serving him in, in ministry amongst the church here? Are you serving him uh, in mission, looking for individuals who do not know Jesus and sharing the love of Jesus with them? What, what's your next step to fellowship with Jesus? Have you done that? We're going to take a moment and pray. We're going to have a time of response. And I want to invite you, if, if Jesus is pressing upon something on you, if the Spirit is urging you in something that you need to make, to, to, to a decision that you need to make, Maybe it's a public decision to join this church. Maybe it's a, a, a public decision that you know as we experience baptism today that you need to be baptized. Maybe you just need to come forward and to pray. Whatever it is, would you follow Jesus? Would you be sensitive to the urging of the Spirit? Don't listen to a sermon about the Spirit of God living in you and ignore what the Spirit of God is doing in you. Let's pray.